Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Let's Give It a Voice at the Sunday Show with myself, A. Simbeng. Today, we have a very a powerful team of ladies here with me on the show. And we are all ladies today, and we have a special topic to talk about. Each and every one of us on this show today we have something in common. And that thing in common is bereavement. July is annually regarded as Bereaved Parents Awareness Month, a month dedicated to raising awareness of the support necessary when one endures the devastating loss of a child. So, we are having uh, the second episode of a three-part series on bereavement because July is Bereaved Parents Awareness Month. So at the Sunday show, we thought it was a good idea. We have a series of discussions on this topic, bereavement, because it's an area where most people avoid to talk about. We all know death is inevitable. It's something that would happen, but it happens at different times. It affects people differently when it happens and people grieve differently. So our topic on bereavement today is supporting individuals during bereavement. So I just want to welcome each and every one of you watching. I am A. Simbeng and I am the host today. So if you've just joined in, share, the broadcast and invite your friends to watch because our intention today is to create a conversation, to start a conversation on this topic which most often people regard as a taboo topic. We would like people to talk about death as any other conversation that every other person has in their daily life. And by so doing, we will be raising awareness we will be educating, we will be empowering and inspiring, and then giving hope to anyone who has faced the devastating effects of child loss. And so I will just introduce my guests in the panel today. So Gwen, you are welcome once more. Thank you. Yeah, welcome so much, Vivi. Vivi. Stacey, it's so good to be here and nice to meet you, Gwen. Same here. Nice to meet you. I yeah. like the yellow, red, and blue. <laughs> oh, yeah, it matches. <laughs> well, that's that's true. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and having this discussion today, we want to help every parent or anyone who has lost a daughter or a son. Uh, at any stage in their lives, it may be during pregnancy, it may be shortly after pregnancy, it may be some years or several years after after the birth of a child. But once we continue talking about this topic, giving a voice to the topic, it will make it less emotional and less um, make people feel comfortable, feel free talking about this topic. I'll pass over to Gwen to give us a brief introduction of herself once more because you were here on the first episode of this show. Mm -hmm. So we had over to you. I don't know. Do you hear? Does it play back to you or is it just me? It, it plays back. So that's why I took this call. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I am Gwen, like you said. Um, we did the first segment of the show. I'm a mother of two. Last Corey three years ago to a brain cancer. And yeah, thank God I have Courtney now. Tomorrow is actually Corey's birthday, and we're thinking of ways to celebrate his birthday tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. So thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but it just plays bad. There's a little bit of a feedback echo, but we can hear you clearly. Okay. When I'm talking, does it echo? Just faintly. It's okay though. We can we can live with it. 
Okay, that's fine. So today we are on, our, on, on the second episode of the, of a three part series, which we will be discussing on the support that can be given to a parent during bereavement. So we have three guests today. That's yourself, Sister Viola, Gwen, and then there's Mary Abanga, who will soon be coming into the show. She's just a little bit late. So we are going to continue with our show. Then I'll, I'll hand over to each and every one of you to, 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 give us, to, to give us a brief explanation of how you are related to this topic. And before we dive into our questions, over to you, Sister Lee. Um, thank you so much, AC, for having me on your show. Um, I'll never forget you reaching out to me. I was pleasantly surprised. I also had no idea that July was devoted to the month of bereavement. And I love the fact that you've picked this topic, um, which seems to center around when mothers and fathers, because fathers often get forgotten from this equation, lose your child. And Gwen, I am so sorry for your loss. It's a pleasure to meet you. I mm -hmm. suppose you want me to share my story, is that it? Yes. Okay. When I was 19 years old, uh, living in the UK, I got pregnant. And for the majority of the pregnancy, I think my mind was somewhere else or in denial because by the time my mother found out, I was already seven months pregnant. And even at that stage, there was a sense of loss that, there is a, a point in your life that you can't go back to. You can't turn the clock back. But my son was born premature. His name was Asimah. And I had the strangest experience at the time that he was leaving my body. I knew he was going to die. And I remember saying to my mom, he's dying. He's not going to be here for long. And they all looked at me strangely. I'm not on earth you talking about. But when people talk about a mother's intuition, I used to think that it's some mystic thing. But no, there is a unique relationship between a mother and the human beings that can hear your heartbeat from the inside of your body. And you are never the same whether that person lives or dies. But long story short, Asema was born with um, hydroacetylus. And within his particular range of this illness, the brain hadn't formed. So he was blind, he was deaf, he was insensate, and he was completely unaware of the world around him. But he had the basic reflexes of human life, eat, sleep, cry, uh, could uh, react to stimulus, but only on an involuntary basis. Now, in the UK, 1985, as a 19-year-old, uh, the, the issues were compounded by the fact that um, society finds these things inconvenient in the same way that death and bereavement are an inconvenience, not just to the individual who's experiencing it, but for everybody else around who now has to come face to face with the emotions and the experience that that person is going through. I've come to understand and realize that death has got nothing to do with the person who has passed away and has everything to do with the individuals who are left behind. Now, you were saying a little bit when we were getting into the preamble of this conversation, AC, that one of the goals is to make it less emotional. With all due respect, I completely don't have that same viewpoint. You know me well from Facebook because you've seen that Every year on his birthday and the, and the anniversary of his death, I write a letter to my son. Gwen, if my son was alive today, July 6th would have made him 35 years old. He uh -huh. died when he was seven months old. Time has moved on and I am still defining myself through the backdrop of his death. There's a tendency in our culture to try to make people feel better by telling them what they should do, like feel less emotional, for example, is a valid thing to say. But for some individuals, letting go of that emotion is actually a second death. Sometimes we're more alive because of the pain. And we're more alive because of our awareness of how fleeting life is. So different people have different ways of dealing with it. But especially as mothers, when you lose a child, the rest of your life is defined by how you mature through that experience. And for me, the first 10 years, actually the day that Esteme died 
I was on a train with my god sister, and as we were pulling into uh, into Reading from Paddington, it was February tenth, and I literally felt a piece of my heart just squeeze, and I said to Mary, I think my son has died because they, but they had already told me he wouldn't live more than a year, but he seemed to have been doing well. And I had him living with a foster mother in Bracknell because I really felt that if my son lives, I need to be able to be educated and not do this on welfare. I had an idea in my head of how I wanted us to live. But I also knew that I couldn't take care of this sick child by myself. So I co-parented with an assigned foster mother who I selected from, a whim from four women. When I picked those women, I said, I don't care what religion you are, as long as you have something to sustain you when this child grows. I know I'm going to be okay. My life is defined by a set of values that help me to make sense of the world. But I don't know about you. So on February 10th, when I stepped off the train, I remember smelling the air. I could have sworn I smelt my mother's perfume come by me. And as I got on the bus and got into my home, the front door was open and my brother and sisters were sitting around just looking blank and lost. There I am, but at this time I'm now 20 years old. My, my siblings are teenagers and my brother said, no, no, he's not dead. So the first thing I said is, is this semi dead? They said, no, apparently he's ill. He might just be sleeping. Do you want a cup of tea? And my sisters said to me, yes, he's dead. And I remember the scream that came from my body. I don't think I've ever heard or felt anything so primal, so guttural. It's as if it almost came from the right hand side of me outside of my body. And I just literally collapsed. And I've always defined my life as before that point and after that point. And I so wished in that moment that it wasn't true, that I was dreaming. And the fact of the matter is my mother had left. She had been on that train station. She had been on that platform. She had gone to my son, because we are Cameroon, this woman's a white woman, my mother wanted to somehow find some um, comfort in the act of ritual to wash that baby, dress him one last time. And I remember asking, don't do anything till I get there. And I could only go in the morning. And so she was this center car for me. My mother had washed him. And when I held him, there is nothing like holding a dead body. There is a weight to it that is very different from a heavy object. There is a coldness that literally leads from their bones into yours. It is a, a different kind of cold. It's not like holding ice. It's not like holding a cold stone. It is the feeling of no more life. Death. Death is so specific, so very surreal. It is the other side of the place that we all know we must go to. We have no idea what it's like. I held my son for about three hours. I needed to do that. I did not want to hear anybody tell me, don't worry, it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. And it is my right to decide when it's going to be okay. I buried him on um, the 20th of February. It's cold in England at that time. I have very little memory of the funeral, except that he had a white coffin and there were lots of people there. And my brain had already shut down and decided, maybe when I think back on it, maybe I was saying to him, screw you, you left me, I'm pissed. I'm going off to take my lessons, I'm going off to do my exams. And for the next three to five years after that, I became very neglectful of myself. I avoided real emotion. I thought I was contagious, that if anybody came near me, their child would also die. I would be friends with my friends when they were pregnant, but the minute that baby was born, you would never see or hear from me again. I spent another 15 years reassembling my heart so that I could deal with this new version of myself. And as we all know, there isn't a word in the English language for a woman whose child is dead. You can be an orphan, you can be a widow, you can be a widow. But what is the name of a woman whose society, and sometimes we say this, it may not even be true, is not capable of shepherding life successfully into the world and beyond. So what you're left with is a silent, monotonous narrative 
that goes playing in your head of what if, maybe if I'd done something differently, uh, around about this time, such and such would happen. It is only there, and then there is that sense of guilt. If I'm not thinking about him every minute of the day, I'm a bad mother. I am not grieving correctly. When is it time for me to feel happy? Um, do I have permission to be okay? But I reached a point where I could smile and laugh about a summer and imagine and be grateful for the fact that I had the chance to live on with him because I knew he was going to I just didn't know when. I tried to cram in as many uh, experiences with him because I knew I would need that. So here we are, we've been dead 34 years and it's still a new experience to deal with. The grief mutates as my understanding of the world continues. And when I met my husband, his child was sick, sickle cell, usually terminal. And it brought us together because I said to him, I know what it's like to have a sick child. I know what it's like to go to the hospital every minute. And my daughter, she died three years ago, our stepdaughter, my stepdaughter. So I had been through it once. And I foolishly thought, if and when Jasmine dies, I've done the rehearsal. There is no rehearsal for death, no matter how many times you do it, especially when it's your offspring. Because as parents, they are our opportunity at immortality. We're hoping that they will carry the best of us into the future. But now you have a termination of that potential. So that's my story. Um, it's something I live with every day. I think there are days I deal well with it. There are times when I want to feel the depth of that tragedy and that pain and relive it again in my brain to reconcile it. But mostly I am at the point of deep acceptance and joy that I even had this opportunity to know this baby. But this year was not the same. With so many mothers with black sons, I did not do well with, with the anniversary of Estella's birthday because all of a sudden life just seems way too precious. There is no price, no words. And so it's been a little bit difficult. Thank you so much. Good. Um, thank you so much guys for watching. Share please. We all know that this is a very emotional topic. Yes, I actually had a few tears. To me, yes. I do. Shedding tears for the loss of a child is no more. Yeah. That's another way of showing love. The love the world can give to your child, that's how sometimes we we have to show them, we have to tell them that we still love them, even though they are not here. And sometimes how we show that love is through, is through tears. So today, guys, we are going to elaborate and reflect and prolong on our mental health. We will look at some of those things of soothing words that can be said to a very parent and how, um, how you as a family, as a friend, as a community can support the family that is bereaved or that is support the family. It, um, um, the man or the woman, because July is the rift parent awareness so we are concentrating on parents and the rift men. So, Anything, sorry, do you have your Facebook on to see you? On my, let me see. No, I have it just on okay. my phone. Because on my when Israel um, was talking, it was okay, but when you're talking, that's when the echo comes. Mm -hmm. I I don't actually know why it's going. Honestly, oh, have a phone on. Yeah, it's it's on, but it's not on Facebook. You have? Are you? Do you also have your laptop on? Yeah, I'm using my laptop at the moment. Okay, I think it's because you've got two um, audio sources going on at the same time. One of them needs to be switched off. I think it's your phone. Okay. Let me check and see. Is that better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Wait, what do you think? Yeah, it is way better. Is it is that okay? Completely, a hundred percent. Okay. So before we introduce our, our guest who has just come into into the studio, it, it is necessary for us to understand that 
the child loss occurs during pregnancy. It occurs soon after birth, within the first years of a child's life on earth. It can occur during childhood and adulthood. So anytime a parent loses a child, no matter the age, the child may just be one or two minutes like mine was. The baby it, it may be a, um, a miscarriage that is still a loss, that's still a baby. So when we say child loss, it's not only a baby. The loss of a baby girl or a baby girl at any stage of their lives. So, Marie, you are welcome today and thank you so much for honoring my invite. Thank you. Such an honor to finally be on the platform with Paula and with you, Royal Warrior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we, before you came in, Marie, on Sister Viola was giving an intro. She gave an introduction of herself and she told us her story with, with her, her little boy. Seme, who is now a big boy in heaven. Before we continue, which is something I had forgotten, can we just observe maybe a minute of silence for all our babies who are in heaven before we continue? Please. And may the soul be all the faithful departed to the mercy of the rest in peace. And then we are also sending our words, love, and kisses and hope to any parent who has experienced the loss of the child. Marie, we are going to come over to you to tell us how your relationship is with the topic of bereavement. You know, I. I attempted suicide um, exactly one year after I lost my daughter. Okay, tell us. And I was even pregnant. Yeah, tell us the, the how what happened. How you how you lost your child? Are you able to? Are you able to? Well, we are yeah, sure. Oh, come on, come on. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, I gave birth to her. And it's so funny, I've written about it. Like I I went to the what we consider the best hospital in Rwanda, that is a reference hospital, and I took a private room because I knew it was going to be a girl, and I wanted to just spoil my daughter. And then that is the girl I lost like the very next day. And of course, I, I was so angry, I blamed her father because when I gave birth. 15 minutes later, she had some breathing problems and they had to put her in the incubator. And um, at night, they said there was a medication that was needed. And he asked the doctor if he could get it the next morning. I was on the bed. Before they took her away, so I was saying to myself, How can he even ask that kind of question? Like, can I get the medication tomorrow? My friend, get out and go and look for that thing wherever it was nine or 10 pm, and he was probably just as exhausted. So, when the baby died at about 4 am. I couldn't just take that, you know. I went under the bed in the hospital. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I just couldn't deal with that. And so I shut down. And um, I got depressed and, you know, whatever was happening in my life, anybody made no sense. And, uh, well, one year after that, although I was five months pregnant, that's another story, I picked up a knife. So talking about how the loss of a child can affect a mother's mental health. I would be like, it can. I have known a mother when I was in Belgium who committed suicide one year after her daughter died. Okay, 
Yeah, so we, we are still going to come in to go into saying how, how the loss of a child affects our mental health. And thank you so much for, for the introduction and telling us the story about it's unclear, right? Yes, unclear. So before I mean, we continue, there have been other ones, the miscarriage and stuff, but Ash Claire was like the apex for me. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry for the loss of Auntie Claire. I know she's she's 12 in heaven, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And before we continue, all four of us here, we will remember our children's names that in mind. My little boy is David Gates, and he's going to be um, three years in heaven. And he lived for one hour, 20 minutes. And we are also thinking of Ekeme, who is in heaven. Is he 34? He seven months, he would, he would be 35 now. 35, okay. We are thinking about him as well. And King Curry, King Curry, we are thinking about you and we are celebrating your birthday tomorrow. Right, Gwen? Yeah, he will be having tomorrow. Okay, so over to you now. You you tell us the story with inquiry again. Oh. Mm. Ha, huh. Corey was um, almost six, a few months to six years when he passed. He was obviously a very smart, smart boy in school. And that's how we found out that he had a brain tumor because one day I just got a call from his teacher and he wasn't um, responding in class to things that the teacher would expect him to respond to because normally he was one of the smartest kids in his class. So that raised a flag for the teacher. And before she knew it, he started um, drooling. So she took him to the school nurse and, and they called me. By the time I was talking to him, he was fine. He was like, mommy, I'm okay. But I came to school anyway to pick him up. So I decided to take him to the emergency room. By the time we got to the emergency room, he was doing okay. But I remember the previous day, the teacher had reported he had a fall in school out of nowhere. So he normally didn't have any pre-existing conditions before that. So when we got to the hospital, he was doing fine. I explained to the doctor, I think he was having a seizure in school, and that's how he was drooling. But he never had that before. You know, the emergency room, they would take you up and down and all that, and I had to go to work. So I left him with his dad. So apparently, as they were in the hospital, about to being discharged, he had an episode again. He was just dancing and started drooling. That's when they got the alarm, and then they had to go ahead and do the MRIs and found out he had a brain tumor. And that's how Corey's journey began. He fought for about 11 months. Around that time, everybody, most people, for brain cancer. Unfortunately, he won the battle in another way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And so sorry once more. I remember when he, when when Corey passed away, I was in Cameroon when his dad told me. So we will always remember him and we will always remember our children. And any of you watching, if you've lost a child before, so we have you in our in our prayer. So we are going to go right dive right into our question, starting with Marie. So the loss of the, the loss of the loss one impact. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, the loss of the loss one can impact on the survival that us can impact on our, our mental health. And one thing which Mr. Viola said said earlier was that death has nothing to do with the, with the person who died, but it has more. It has a lot to do with those of us left behind. So, Marie, can you tell us exactly how the, the loss of Aunt Claire has affected you as an individual and generally how it affects, it, it, it affects someone's mental health? 
especially in the Greek-speaking pronouns. Well, I already said how it affected me, affected my mental health, and that was another of the traumatic um, situations in my life, which kind of all make up my post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. Uh, you know, each person takes it differently. Uh, maybe also because of the surrounding circumstances, of the support you got, uh, a lot of other things, right? And like Vala was saying, uh, the questions you ask yourself, was I a good mom? What could I have done to prevent this? All of those things. But the truth is that the child is gone. So um, how it affects another person's mental health on a general spectrum is that there is this grief and it fluctuates. It's not like it's a... Uh, it's linear, like from Monday to Sunday, 10 a.m. each day, you cry. You can cry at 8, you cry at 5, you cry tomorrow, you don't cry when you And people may not understand. Why are you crying like that? Ah, how many years today? You know, there's some anniversaries that will come and go, nothing, some will come. So there's no kind of past rule. But people don't understand that. And sometimes even you may want to be hard on yourself like, I should have gotten over this by now, but it's 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 a whole process to kind of like route your brain, your, your thought pattern. You have to re re repeat the same thing. You and when you have lost the baby, what can replace that? Another baby? It's only that particular baby, but even that particular baby will not come back. So it is something like you know, go through the stages of grief. Anyhow, any day, any month, it is really erratic. And so people need to know that a mother who has lost a child has lost a part of themselves because that child was a part of that woman right from the conception. It's like the man brings a pen, but the ovulation or what you call it, the fertilization takes place in the woman and it stays in the woman. So that life grows up in the woman. And then it comes out, that is, it comes out with your with part of you, the placenta. And then that life goes and you are still there. You are like, why couldn't I die and let this child live? I have already lived here. So I think we deal with that guilt. We deal with that need of constant assurance that it's not our fault. You know, stuff like that. But people don't really get it that way. The more society and maybe even the people around you put pressure on you to get over it, the more you really don't get over it. Either you bottle up and pretend you have gotten over it, or you explode. And then they say, okay, well, she's crazy. Small picking so you are reacting like that. What if it was a 50 year old guy? So those kind of things that people say, you know, sometimes it just make it worse. For you. You can get so depressed. On the other hand, you don't. You bottle up. You don't talk. You don't do the things you need to do anymore. You even complete the other children. It's not those other children. It is you, and it is the loss, and the the, the, the everything about that loss that is making you be that way. So there, there needs to be a lot of of compassion. Of, I remember I talked with you once and I told you I never talked about that loss with my ex-husband and I have just wrote him out but I felt so bad and I really held, held it a good thing for long because we never talked about it ever and that's so wrong we need to talk with the mothers we need to just sit down and sit down by them while they cry or just hold their hand. We need to do something. If not, they can sink. Before you know it, somebody has committed suicide. You say, I never saw the signs. Well, they were there. Yeah. 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 A mother who has lost a child has lost a part of herself. That's perfectly right. After I lost my little boy, I till today, I don't know if there's any, any other love greater than the love of a child. I, I still feel it. Yeah, how, how I lost mine was I was almost 21 weeks, plus five days. And my waters just went. 
yeah because i've had i've had an experience with premature before so it was kind of it, it i'm already a high risk patient when i'm pregnant so somehow that part was missed out in my life my service wasn't finished. so one day i didn't feel all right i went to the hospital it's like then suddenly my water just broke and everything just leaked out and leaked out. So bef because before the, the, the baby was not yet up to 24 weeks. So the option I was given was, you are not yet in labor. So what we can do is termination of pregnancy because your baby is still alive or conservative management until you go into labor. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine the fact that I would allow that little boy to move around in me to terminate it. So I said no determination and I was going to go with conservative management until whatever level kicks me. And I went on for two days, three days, and the baby um came out, he was already two weeks. Like he was already two weeks. So he, he his leg came out. I mean, just like you know, the baby, the baby was come out in his time. So we came out with this like for the next two days. There was still no labor. So I had to be, I had to be induced because I had refused that I was that, that I wasn't going to terminate the pregnancy. And and again I knew that there are of course people who can stay for baby with for two weeks, but some hospital concluded a, a baby's hope at 22 weeks not viable, so they cannot be resuscitated even if you give birth to them and they are still they are still alive. But, but I was at a stage where I, I could I I wanted to go so that that baby could leave. Because to me that little life I felt like he was fighting in there, he was trying in there holding on to me. His own breath in order to move because normally when you're waiting for children, the baby's already vulnerable. You are already vulnerable. There, there are also there are already high chances of you, the parent, having an infection and the baby having an infection as well. But I held on, and the little man held on until when I was induced and they should be after he was born at um, 22 weeks plus two days. And again, the little man lived for one hour, 20 minutes with no help, nothing until he he gave up. So that's my story. That's how I lost my little boy. And he's going to be three years on the 11th of September in heaven. And his name is David J. We will always remember them. David. Yes, sorry. sorry? I didn't hear his full name. David J. Davy, it's actually David. So I, I shortened it and I and I have made it a little that they cherish beloved here. Yeah. So as you said, Marie, true. The love of the child will affect us whether you are the mom or you are the parent. It, but it affects the individual differently. On our first episode, when mentioned that there's no room for one room to do, but there's an unhealthy and unhealthy way to do it. And Mary, you also mentioned that it is necessary to talk when you are grieving, especially the partner. Unfortunately, something we get too too um too sad too emotional too involved with the emotions going going on around us because of the grief we go through the roller of emotion and at times it's very easy to forget that there are other people around you who have also been affected by the loss of the baby and we like the dad or the siblings and in the long run that is not thought of. It can also have a great effect on our mental health. And thank you so much for, for bringing that. So, since I, um, so I'll go over to to Gwen. When a parent endures the loss of a child at any age, the pain is quite unbearable. Then there are some of there are some moments where we really need friends. We really need family. We really need our loved ones to be by us. 
sometimes we just need to hear a nice word, a good word, a good or a soothing word from someone around you. Mm-hmm. When you lost the story, how was it handled? How do people control you? So many ways. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm just, like Viola said, blurred from that moment, right? But thank God for modern technology. I still have videos and um, pictures that would bring me back to to that moment. Unfortunately, when Corey died, I had so much going around me. We talked about this the other day. I felt like, or feel like, circumstances that were surrounding me at that time stole my time to grieve him the way I should have grieved him at that time, right? There was just so much to grieve at that time. At that time, I just finished having um, treatment, cancer treatment. I just finished with chemotherapy and surgeries and all that. Then he got the going through treatment, then we're going through divorce, and then he passed. It was just so much going on at the same time. So I cannot even figure out, is this really being me going through the things I'm going through on my own? Is this really that of him being sick, or is it him dying, or is it me going through a divorce, or is it, it was just so much happening at the same time. Um, so I cannot really figure out how my grief went through, but I'm happy how it went through in a whole nutshell. It's even harder when you're grieving and then you have to think of the other people around you. For instance, grieving Corey, I knew that the priority would be his sister. She was nine when Corey died. How old was she? Nine. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's it's even harder because you have to know how to process things. It was just all them. Her best friend, her everything. That's another level. Going through grief and then making sure you understand how she's grieving, how she's going through that, and then going through the fact that we're going through a divorce. So my grief was really stolen away from me because I had all these other things that I had to handle, right? But today we are in a better place. I'm happy that at this time, Courtney can talk about Corey and we laugh about it. Unlike before, she would just shut down. And uh, the other day we were in a car, she does tutoring. So we went to a tutoring session and then we saw one of her classmates, older sister. So. When we got into the car, she said, oh, mommy, I saw my classmate's older sister. I said, what's she doing in tutoring? Why is your classmate not there? Um, she said, I guess she, the older one is not doing well in school. I said, oh, yeah, the older ones are always like that. So, she, <laughs> so she's the older one to Corey, right? So she turns around and tells me, well, now that Corey is dead, what are you going to do? So it means I'm stuck with her, even if she's not as smart as Corey was. So we all burst out laughing. And then it dawned on me that it's, it's even relieving that we can talk about Corey and now smile and laugh about it. Then yesterday she asked me, Mommy, what are we going to do tomorrow, Sunday, for Corey's birthday? Then I'm like, what do you want? I don't know what I want to do for his birthday. What do you want to do? I don't still not till now she hasn't told me what she wants to do, but I know she has a plan. So now I try to work my grief how she feels because she feels that she talks about him most of the time. It does to set me into a mood where I'm gonna cry. Like I was telling you, AC last time, how she would even say, Oh, before talking about him, mommy, now that I want to make you my bird. Then she would say what she would say. So Grief, on the other hand, uh, the worst kind of grief is when you grieve with regret. Like Miss Maria was saying earlier, and I was just telling myself how thankful I am to God that I never went through that. Um, currently, I'm a hospice nurse, so I see a lot of families 
going to really great. And that is the worst grief you can ever go through because it takes you forever to heal. For me, I was lucky that I knew and I know that I did all I could. I did my best for my son when he was alive. And uh, it, I had the power to make him stay. I did all that I could in my power, but he still did not make it. So when he died, like we were saying last time, actually I grieved him before he died. I did anticipatory grieving more than I did grieve when he had already died. It was all the times with him in the hospital. I would cry with him, pray with him. I did all that grieving when he was still alive. So by the time he finally died, I I had done all my grieving. Not all, but most of it. But at this time, I'm like, you know what? If you had the power, you, Corey, would have stayed in your mother. If you didn't stay, because it's not in our hands. And he did, he did me. So for me, grieving, I think, was a little easier when it comes to his death because I knew that and I know that I did all that a mother can do for a child to keep him alive. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. When you grieve in grieving in regret, it's a very difficult place to be at. But yeah. once you know that you did everything you could do or any everything you could have done, then it the grief becomes beautiful. Yes, yeah, but I, I always also say when you grieve and regret, the first thing to do to be worried is always to forgive yourself, even if you have those regrets. Like Miss Maria said. If you give yourself that opportunity to say, okay, I forgive myself for doing this, and knowing that he will forgive you on the other hand, that's the only way we will get past to grieve in a more easy way. That's very true. And what, what are some of the, I know so many friends would have called to visited you or, or said things. But if, if you if you meet someone in who is grieving or someone who is grieving, what do you think are some of the things that you, that you can tell them that you think will make them feel just a little bit better? You may not change the situation. And we all know that sometimes certain words being said, though they are meant well, can be quite hurtful. But what are some of the things that someone can say to you that you say, oh, you feel like you feel that this person cares? Is it aimed at me? Not to go into, yeah. Like, um, like I said, I do hospice, right? So I am fortunate to be in a in this place every day where I meet somebody who needs those encouraging words, or who needs to know how am I going to get out of this? How am I even going to go through this? For me, when Corey died, most of the things that I remember now, it's not even the call or the financial help that people gave me a lot. The things that stay with me is the hugs that people gave me. Now I know most of my consolation, because when I even go through my pictures now, I could feel those hugs. I have a lot of pictures that I actually made a collage of all the hugs that I got through Corey's funeral and all of that. So I give that back to especially my patient family, all I can do is, can I hug you? It's so healing to so many people. Some people are not touching, but I always just have to ask permission. Can I give you a hug? It's not just healing for that person. To me, it's even healing to me. I'm also fortunate that I get to talk about Corey all the time. Like Ms. Mary was saying, talk therapy for me is everything. Some people don't want to talk about it because they think it hurts you. Oh, if I talk about Corey, it's going to bring her memory and that's going to hurt her. But no, even if I cry, it takes off that burden. Even if I talk about him, most of the time I talk about him, chances are I will smile. Then I would even cry. Even if I cry, the next minute I'm going to say something about him that brings joy, that brings sense of life about him. So talk therapy is awesome. Let's not stop. Think, let's stop thinking that. Let's not talk about it. Like so many people would even stop calling you because they don't want to call her because she's going to start crying. 
It's like they're preventing you from getting to that place to breathe. But no matter what, you still have to get there. And that's the only way you get out of it, by going through that door. So talk therapy, I try to talk to people that are going through grief. Let's talk about it. Tell me good stories about Corey. Like when I go to my patients and their families, I want to hear those beautiful things. Let's not talk about him laying on the bed or the last minute when he was dying. That's only going to bring us hurt. Let's think about those good moments, right? For me, I'm fortunate that Corey had lived for five years plus, that I have those memories to talk about. Unfortunately, maybe for you who are married and in parallel, you don't have such memories. But to people that are married and they have those memories, I want to hear them. Let's talk about them. Tell me more about your child. So those things really actually help. I talk about Corey the least um, opportunity I get. Um, and it definitely brings me back. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, so one of the things you, you can actually say to a parent who has lost a child is you just ask them, tell me about your child. Mm -hmm. Some people it a bit uncomfortable, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite helpful right. to talk about, about your, your, your child who is in heaven. One time I mentioned my little boy's name, Ruby King. The name itself to me is quite sexy and it's so. Each time I mention it, I always smile, even though I know I will never call David Bruce and I hear him running down the stairs or he says, Mom, and he's running towards me. But I feel good when I pronounce that name. So over to you now, Sister V. So the love, the worst love that a parent can ever feel or can ever experience is the love of a son or a daughter. In our culture, or traditionally, almost everywhere, it's expected that children, our children, are supposed to bury us. But unfortunately, as we have all experienced, we've had to bury a child. And the pain, the pain is so painful, <laughs> as, as I always say. The pain, sometimes you, you not even sometimes, you cannot raise it, you cannot point away from it hurts. At times, you actually feel like there is a sword that has been pierced through your heart, and you can feel it there, you can see it there, but no, no person around you sees it. And when this happens, we can actually go into isolation. We can actually lose interest in people around us. So, what are some of the possible ways through which a bereaved parent can be supported by both friends, family, and even the entire community? Well, I can only speak from my own perspective. Um, first of all, feelings are neither good or bad. It's what we do with them and how we express them and communicate them. Sometimes we don't feel pain, we feel numbness, completely cut off and incapable of accessing the emotions that signpost the journey of where you are in grief, which is why maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years later, out of nowhere, it can hit you. Or you think you're okay, and then things change. Sometimes we don't want to hear a damn thing from anybody. Sometimes we need silence. Don't talk. It's best to ask, what can I do for you? I love what Gwen said. Sometimes just a hug, just holding hands. When my daughter died three years ago, um, a friend sent me a seafood pie. It was like being hugged from the inside. This thing was so warm and carbohydrates, carbohydrates, good fish, that food and the emotional, that the emotion that I um, experienced when I remember her saying, this might make you feel better. Or my husband bringing me a piece of chocolate or me putting on something that he wants to listen to. We assume, I think, and especially in our culture, that there is a playbook that everybody has to go through so that everybody can shut the hell up and get on with whatever it is that we call daily life. And that's not always appropriate. In my case, because I wasn't allowed to even tell anybody he had been alive, I had to suffer that tragedy and that guilt with, and that, um, that grief with guilt, with regret. And it was even mentioned in the magazine, Woman's Own back then posted a very nasty story about a black woman that abandoned her child and a good white woman had to come and take care of him. And that isn't what happened at all. 
That to me is even worse than the life and death of a cement. So there is so many complex things that go on, just like you said, Gwen, all the things going on around at the same time that you can't pull the threads in order to weave a cloth that is comprehensive enough for you to say, this is what it is, because that's just not there. Words that you can say to people, only tell them what they ask you to say. Don't assume that you're gonna come and make all those feelings manageable. Ask. Sometimes you need to ask, what can I do? Do you need me to help make you feel better? Do you want me to sit with you? Do you want to talk? And any topic they want to talk about is fine. And it's true, you said so earlier. Some people say, look, you've been going about this a long time. Now, I know this hasn't got anything to do with children, but Mary, do you remember when I was really, really, really upset that Prince died? I remember. Huh. That, till now, is, is, I can feel the stress in my stomach. We all experience that, in, and I never met the man. And it's very different from when my son died. But when a parent loses their child, what they need is closeness of community, understanding, and they want to be able to have the intimacy to express exactly how they feel without people trying to tell them whether the feeling or the reactions are right or wrong. Don't try to tell people. But I also recommend that you keep a diary. It will help you to navigate the journey and make sense of it a little bit later. And I wish I had done that. Luckily, I have a really good memory. So I do remember the last 34 years of his death and all the things that I did that were self-abusive and destructive as well as healing. So just be there for people. Know that there's intimacy and that um, you don't always have to have words to say. Take each situation uniquely. And every death that happens around that person thereafter will be a bit of a signpost. I hope that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that. And and Marie, how can how can a parent be helped, especially if their mental health has been affected? So we we all know that if you are um, looking at the, the the model of the one of the students in depression, what if a parent has been stuck in this thing for too long? How can they be helped? There's something. What is the word? You know, when you when you look at the stages of grief, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the model of grief where you have denial, acceptance, bargaining, uh, depression, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. One of so, so at the depression stage, what if a parent has been there but he has been stuck in that depression state for too long? How can that parent be helped? Does how how can a parent's mental health be, be helped at that point because if they get stuck for too long and they're depressed then there's something wrong and they and which means they need help so what can they do to help well we talked about dog therapy and i'm a psychotherapy so um i can only say seek professional help uh, too long how much is too long first of all and have they been constantly in that state and um, how have they been reacting and acting during that too long stage? Yeah. All of those things, we will have to look at those things. And uh, I think that to help somebody, don't put the person in a tight position anymore. Then the person is going to defend themselves and are not going to open themselves up to help. So you have to remember that there should be no blaming. Even if you feel they have been there for too long, you know the one, you don't tell it to them. Leave it to the therapist to tell it to them in a kind of way like, okay, what next can we do? What next can we do? And then they're going to unfold that everything and then move on. But if you are using your mouth, kind of like insult them and say, you've been on this thing for too long. Like my once he asked me, are you the only one who lost that child? I was like, that I stopped asking. I didn't want to talk about it again. I, so I never, I, nobody talked about it with me. I didn't talk about it with nobody until I left this country and I came back. So I may have stayed in my own state for too long. That would not have been anybody's problem. Nobody may have even known. Sometimes that's the best people don't even know, right? 
You yeah. must kick up. Yeah, you, you put the fonts and then inside you, you know what you're going to. So uh, please go seek for help, um, see a therapist, talk to other people, other mothers, for example. I believe so much in the power of prayer support, people um, sharing with each other, holding each other's hand, even virtually. For me, I find a lot of support and joy with my virtual family, especially in things like grief, mental health, and stuff like that. So I don't joke with my virtual family. There might be very few, but I'm very grateful for that. That's something that I can advise people to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So talk therapy is very helpful. Um, joining a groups of parents who have lost a child before, where you have similar stories to talk about. Prayer support is good. And as Sister Vivi said, journaling. Journaling is one of the things that helped me quite a lot. I have, yes, I have this book where um, my book will, will be coming out soon on grief, grief, from grief to grief. So I wrote and I wrote, I have, in that book, in that manuscript, you have the real lesson by emotions about anyone that I could blame or anything that I could blame and all the questions that I asked myself, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? What is it that I could have done that I didn't do? So I found particularly that writing was very, very helpful. I started writing the first day I stepped into the hospital and, and I even wrote down the names of the nurses, the midwives, the doctors, and how how the relationship with me affected me during the period afterwards. And I discovered that it really, really helped a lot. And one of the things on this show is we, we help individuals to give a voice to these issues, which most often people find them a taboo, or people just find them uncomfortable or very strong to talk about. So, because I know what we do the force to has the power to change our life, it has the power to actually heal our lives and even heal someone else. And so it's very, very necessary for us to talk about grief because it kind of lessens the pain, it lessens the burden that we've been carrying for too long. I remember we did love to marry that we actually in October that we and I had a show on child loss, which we, we actually shared our experiences. And that really helps really helps a lot. If there's anyone out there who is experience the loss of a child and you haven't been able to talk about it. We are here. We have different areas of experience. Mary is a psychotherapy. Um, all of us, we have some form of experience. Because I believe that experience is what we gain when we didn't get what we wanted. Because us, myself, losing a child has actually, I may never have him back but I've gained some form of experience, I've gained some form of knowledge with his passing, and I can actually pass that knowledge or pass that information in the form of educating, empowering, and inspiring other parents out there. So we've been on the show for about an hour. We are moving on to the last part of the show where each and every one of us, we will we will say or any other thing that we think we can talk about this topic. We say how our grief journey was, and and what are some of the strategies, what are some of the things that we did to smile after this grief, to be able to smile after this this tear that we shed for our babies. So Gwen, can we come to you? Just so I get it, you said some of the things that we do need to. Yeah, yeah, because normally when we are grieving, at times you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't see the reason. You don't see any reason for smiling or being happy. But looking at just our faces right now, I know we have a reason now, even when our children are not here and no longer here. So, so what is the particular thing that you do to? You, you, you may not have completely moved forward with the dream because it's always going to be there. But what is how has your journey been from then till now? 
what were your strategies? Hmm. It's just like going through the stages of grief, right? I think with everything I did, adapt a new strategy how to go with it. I just take life each day as it comes. Like we say, some days like you all know, you get up and you're moody. Some days I'm happy. Most of the time I found out that the things that make me smile or cry most of the time is when I'm driving around and I'm in the car. I'm listening to one music can just make me cry. Crying is a good thing I realize. The moment I would cry, I make sure I cry so hard that I sob so hard and I wipe my tears and then I keep driving. Know that for the next one hour I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna smile most of the time because I've actually just gone through that moment and grieve and missing him. I think grieving, like um, Ms. Bell was said, it's not about the person. What brings me hope, tranquility, is that I know that Corey is no more in pain, right? And even if I am hurting, it's just because I miss him. It's not that he is suffering. Or it's not that he's in pain anymore. I ask myself sometimes, would I rather he be here with me and go through the things that he was going through and, or just be in heaven and be at peace? Those questions really bring me back to reality. And uh, I don't have so many answers for the questions that I have. Another thing that takes me through is dreams. Before Corey would always come into to me in my dreams, he sends me messages to people I don't even know, who don't even know him, even through his sister. Those bring me peace. Most of the dreams people had about him was him being happy. What else more would I want from him than being happy? So I realized that going through this process is all about me. It's not about him. It's all about me and his sister. And my priority was Courtney handling it in the way I would she can handle it best. So we did seek counseling. We did go through counseling for a very long time, especially her. And we are still struggling. We are still seeking best counselors to take us through the day. Every day we just handle it differently. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, it, it's very hard. Yeah, I also struggle. I struggle quite, quite a lot. And um, at some point, I actually turned around and because one of the persons I, I blamed a lot was, was God. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, I, I actually had to ask him, why did you have to give me a baby report when I just turned towards me and you, you, you let me be pregnant and then you just took that beautiful dream away. So it kind, it kind of affected me in my face. But at some point, I turned everything around and you told me, I want you to tell me what you want me to do with this experience because I no longer understand them. And then I also looked in, into, I also looked at other women, other people who have experienced child loss. And I looked at the way our faith in my little boy lived. And I said, um, at least I have a few hours to be with him. At least we had a little bit of life. Why should I cry so much more? There are other people out there who have never experienced that little breath. It may just be that one so cough that you had on my chest here. So I turned that grief into gratitude. I turned those one the one or two minutes into memory. And it's not easy, but you can always turn the grief around and look at something positive in it that will make you happy. As Gwen said, grieving is more often or to be about you, how you want to go after you. It's very easy for us to stay in those emotions. It's very easy just to stay there in the morning. You don't need to go you don't need to bed and isolate yourself. But at the same time, we can also put ourselves to go out of it. We will always be the pain of always be gone. But sometimes they say time heals. 
at least I can agree to an extent. It feels because I can work and work on my face now or today. It's not the one I had two and a half years ago. And I know it's important for everyone of you. And over to you, Marie. What, how did you cope? What were your coping mechanisms during that period? Not during that period, long after. Okay. I didn't, I, I bottled it up. I, I just knew that I had to leave. So uh, I carried that with me. I struggled and struggled. And um, that was in 2008. And I, and I sought professional help in 2013. So that was like, what, five years of carrying that alone and then i made that decision in 2013 i was releasing her and uh, i was going to use that to to do something right so what i'm doing now is is what gives me joy and the fact that people i will also die we are all mortals i'm like anyway whatever be the case we would all have gone someday or the other so my angel is there wherever and i'm just doing what i'm doing here and one day i'm going to fly too thank you so much mary thanks a lot for that and over to you sister vivi what were your coping mechanisms your coping strategies they were they were limited because i really wasn't allowed to uh to tell anybody about it. and certainly not really right. but for me personally the way that i coped with it was i danced a lot i wrote a lot um i also want to address the fact that i've been through this journey for a very very long time compared to my dear friends and sisters on this call and i have come to realize that my goal isn't to see light at the end of the tunnel my goal has always been a, a healthy embracing of all of the emotions involved in being alive. So I'm very comfortable with being absolutely freaking miserable because it doesn't last forever. It's the opposite to when I'm absolutely ecstatic with joy. My coping, I therefore think, has been accepting and embracing the journey and trying to manipulate it because I'm not uncomfortable with any of the emotions involved in the life and death of this woman. I, um, I'm okay. I also don't have this idea that I'm gonna see him again. I, I see the world slightly differently. He's all gone on, that's it. He came to me for a reason and it was a privilege. If he had never come to be with me, there was a lot of me that would still be quite unpleasant, immature, ridiculous and stupid. He did a lot for me, and there's such deep gratitude, and I think that's what frames this experience for me. So it's not so, it gets better, it changes. I cope because I had, um, later on, close community. If I had the time, it was the inner dialogue that I had with my mom that kept me going. Wow, that's really wonderful. So for me as well, family plays a very important role. Absolutely. When so one of the things I talked with as well was sustaining because while I was at the hospital, I had a I had a particular collection that I that was a collection of stones that I was doing. So I've, I've listened to them. If you want to listen to a song, and the song brings back someone to life, probably you would have heard it. <laughs> so this is what I was talking about. I danced a lot. There was this one particular song. Um, it was a dance song called Eye to Eye. Um, the song would cause me to cry like there was no tomorrow, but I would play it and dance. And I couldn't play it the way it made me feel. But now I put it on, it just brings back all of the memories of that time and how much I came through it. Uh, it that still had a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's very brilliant. So we are just about to round up now, and I, and I really want to thank all of you for your time and for being able to share your story with us today. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much, Gwen.
and I'm I'm looking forward to us celebrating Corey's birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Corey! And I do have any final words to say to our viewers or to anyone out there. Say that again. Okay. Great. Life is for living. We are all going to die. There's nothing you can do about it. Live. Live like you're going to die. Stop trying to plan and rehearse the ending. You have no control over that. The worst thing that will happen is you're going to die. Somebody's going to buy you a coffin. And they're not going to send you an invoice. Not in heaven and not in hell. You may not. Oh, you may see your loved ones. If that idea keeps you happy, great. Just make sure you make yourself available to life. Live in the honor of those that you've lost. And remember that your children, even though they're not here, imagine if they were watching you being your most glorious self. It's the best that you can do. Thank you. Over to you, Gwen. Any final words before we go? Definitely. Um, it's very important for us to know that our lives, most of the time, is not for us. It is for others. Mm -hmm. The things that happen to us is not to punish us. It's either to teach us a lesson or to teach the world. A lesson. And uh, when we come to terms with that, we will see that we will not question God a lot about the things that happen because we want to see the reason why the things happen the way they happen. Because there's always a reason why it happened. And the moment we find that reason and uh, the purpose why it happens, and we act on it, then it makes the journey easier. Thank you so much. So now, guys, we've come to the end of our show. And thank you so much for, for watching. It's been a pleasure. And next week, or the next two weeks, we are going to have the third, the third um, episode or the last episode of this three-part series. We will be looking into movement and parents and the siblings of the last one. So if there's any sibling out there, so it's quite a happy. So for, for you, everything we have on the show, we will be happy to hear from her. So it's a nice evening to everyone. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Yes, and happy weekend. Have a good evening, Vera. Bye bye.